Hi, welcome to the September 15th episode of 9-11 was an inside job. It's only been four days since the 11th anniversary, and what a media circus they're having. Uh, everything I've seen has been the official story, yay, rah, 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 and justify going after all the Muslims and Arabs, and it doesn't matter that they had nothing to do with it, but we've built an empire on it. And, uh, you know, DHS has reached a new low. They've put out a coloring book, a 9-11 coloring book, telling us about the the terrible events. You get to color the, the, the page where the airplane hits the building, and you get to color the Arab, 19 Arab terrorists. And I'd like to say if anybody out there can get a, their hands on a copy of that coloring book, I'd sure like to have one, and I'll, I'll show it on TV. Um, and I've been going, you know, looking at the various videos that are out there, and they've always had these what I call trolls, that's kind of the, the derogatory term that we use. They call us conspiracy nuts, and that's that discredits us. Well, we call them trolls, that discredits them. Okay, we're even. No, but uh, there's a real good way. The trolls are the ones I, I say that no matter what you say, and a reasonable person, even with a difference of opinion, will agree with something you say, but the trolls never will. And there's a real good test, and that suggests that no matter what the difference of opinion might be, serious people will agree we must have a new investigation. We've never had a criminal investigation, and the 9-11 commission investigation that we did have, even six out of ten of the commissioners say that it was a lie, that it's inaccurate. They were blocked by the Bush administration. They were, it took them four years before they even got started. Well, anyway, that, we're getting off into a different subject now. but. Uh, last week or last show, we we had some problems, but we showed a little bit of the the new uh, video that Richard Gage has been debuting all over the country. Uh, the 9/11, the experts speak out, and here with us is from the Portland Action Arm of AE 9/11 Truth is Marcella Pena. Yes, thank you, um, and thank you for watching. And yes, I do, and I wanted to express to please go to our website um, for the Portland chapter of Architects and Engineers for 9/11 Truth, which is portlandae911truth.org, uh, to look at um, possibly going to see some of the. We have some, we have some presentations lined up for the anniversary week going, f um, going through the 18th of September. Um, uh, with shows in Hood River still and in, at the Portland Library. So please go to our website to, to see any free presentations of the video you're actually seeing right now. We also give out DVDs at it. Um, Tell them about the cable access. Yes, and also go to our website to see wh when, the, when, um, when this video will be shown again in full, um, uh, starting on the... the 17th, I think. Yeah. Well, it, see, we've, we've already shown it three times. It debuted on 9-11. We actually, wow, they really cooperated with us here at Portland Community good. Media, and mm -hmm. they let us show it twice, in the morning and in the evening. So Of 9-11, yeah. So, so there are five showings. there's still two left, two showings yeah. left. And so, th there, yeah, so there are going to be five showings on cable access, and so please do go to our website to see those, um, the times and the days. Again, it's portlandae911truth.org. And at the last show, we saw a portion of, we saw about 37 minutes, about 35 minutes of the, DV of the DVD, which was a concentration on Building 7, which is a building, which is one of, the, one of three skyscrapers that went down on 9-11. And it went down around 5.20, 5.30-ish the day of. So it was hours after, and it was not hit by a building, but it fell down. It fell down, f just fully, um, like a so demolition. Like that's a demo. the one we have pictures of Amy Goodman running from. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah, I that's did not true. know that. She won't talk about it, but we have pictures of her. She heard the countdown, like just like others did at that same time, and she ran, but she won't talk about it. Ford Foundation funding prevents her from talking about 9/11. And so uh, the Building 7, a portion of Building 7 actually fell down at free fall speed. Um, and what we're about to see is a concentration is about 40 minutes on uh, with a focus on the Twin Towers. And the Twin Towers fell at near free fall speed. And you're, you're talking just seconds of difference. And they came down at an average speed of 10, in 10 seconds, so over 100 floors um, falling not just down but out and down out as an explosive out tons not of metal being blasted 600 feet 
and yeah, and so in, in 10 seconds. And so, yeah, so these are just important facts, you know, that um, the Twin Towers fell down at near free fall speed and that the Building 7 actually fell. And actually, not only did the Twin Towers fell, fall at a free fall, near free fall speed, but they actually started falling faster towards their midpoint. Um, just fa accelerated fa by the vacuum of the explosives is some of the surmising uh, ex explanation. But we should really get to the DVD. Yeah, let's start the show. And thank you for for watching. We'll be back. We'll be back. This is the original site of the World Trade Center Twin Towers. Construction is now underway where dramatic new facilities are being erected. Just 10 years ago, the planes hit the towers, cutting through some exterior and interior supporting structural steel columns. The fuel from the planes ignited office fires across several floors. According to the official reports, the structural steel frame was weakened and failed, causing a total progressive collapse of each tower. Does the official explanation make sense? Was there a comprehensive investigation that examined all of the evidence? I walked into the office uh, and the first uh, words that I heard was a plane's just run into the World Trade Center. And my initial thought was, well, that's okay. It's built to withstand uh, a 707. It did not seem possible that these, these towers that were designed to withstand the impact of a 707 could possibly collapse in such a short order of time from the time that they were hit. There's no way the building was designed to take the impact of one, if not more, multiple airplanes. They were designed to withstand uh, hurricane force winds of up to 140 miles an hour. These buildings are built to handle several times the load above them. Those perimeter columns could handle five times the load above them and the core columns can handle three times the load above them. I remember walking up to a window and a young man turned to me with tears coming down his face and he said, will they fall down? And I said, no, never has a steel structure building in the history of steel structured buildings ever fallen down for the reasons of fire. The majority of the jet fuel was burnt up instantly in the big fireball and it was gone. The fires that were left were office furnishings and carpet and things like that. A lot of things in these kind of buildings have to be fire resistant by nature. It's required by code. So there really isn't a whole lot of fuel in there to begin with. The media portrayed the, these fires as being extremely hot, but uh, the fires were not that hot in, in World Trade Center 1 and 2. If you look at the NIST zone data, you could see this. And, uh, and to, to use our own powers of observation, you could tell by, by seeing these fires uh, and seeing black smoke come out the windows, that means that the, the fires were oxygen starved and it was incomplete uh, combustion. And so it was a low temperature fire. I looked up in a manual the burning temperature of jet fuel and found that under the conditions that existed at the World Trade Center on 9-11, uh, that jet fuel had to have been burning at about 750 degrees Fahrenheit. I also noticed that the official explanation of what happened there was that the heat from the fire supposedly softened the steel and thereby brought the buildings down. If you have a flame at 750 degrees, you can hold that flame under a steel beam forever and you'll never reach a high enough temperature to bend steel, let alone melt it. So immediately I knew at that point that the official explanation was dead wrong. than a slow groaning collapse that we might anticipate. The Twin Towers show in the videos a very rapid, sudden onset of destruction. What does this imply? 
Structural steel is required by building and design cones to prevent catastrophic failure and loss of public life. Everybody's seen the building collapses on 9-11, and it was shocking how fast the buildings collapsed. This doesn't happen with structural steel buildings, and never has, and never will again. We assume that fires could destroy a building. Why people select steel buildings is because they would destroy slowly. The uh, basic philosophy of the building codes in the last 75 to 80 years has been to ensure ductile failure of the members to provide for the public safety. Uh, under this philosophy, uh, members that are overloaded will deform elastically uh, within the elastic range of the material with increasingly large deformations and deflections. This gives rise to large deformations that are uh, visible and apparent to the occupants of the structure. It would gradually twist and bend and give people plenty of time and safety in getting out of the building. I would not have expected the whole building to just give in at once. And I thought it rather odd that they um, fell almost perfectly uh, in, in very similar ways, um, it seemed odd that lightning would strike twice. And it certainly would stay in the damage zone. It would not drop down through 80,000 ton of insulated, undamaged structural steel and do it in 12 seconds. This claimed that the upper section of each of the towers crushed the lower section. However, when you watch video closely, in the case of World Trade Center One, you'll see that the upper section disintegrates itself. It appears to be a controlled demolition of its own of the upper section. The top section pushing on the bottom section, it's going to meet equal forces as it goes. Both sections are going to be uh, demolished at the same rate. So by the time you've crushed up 15 stories below it, the top 15 stories are also going to be crushed. Well, there's demolitions uh, done in France, which use what we call the Vernage te technique, where they take out a couple floors worth of columns with hydraulics. They take the columns out and they let the building, the upper section of the building, drop two full floors. And when it impacts the lower section, there's a very definitive, observable jolt, deceleration, and velocity loss. You're looking for a jolt, that this thing, if it actually comes down and hits, you should be able to see the point at which they actually impact because it would actually slow down the motion of the falling block. It never slows down. It accelerates the entire time. And that was what was extremely significant. I was very familiar with uh, the Twin Towers elevator systems. I actually rode up and down elevator shafts on the top of a car going 1,200 feet a minute, uh, you could imagine the experience. Before the tower started collapsing from the top, the antenna started to fall. And the antenna, uh, of course, was over the middle of the elevator shafts. I'm very familiar with the interior structure uh, that surrounded the elevator shafts and uh, the accessibility which the elevator companies had 24-7. The only way that I can see that the towers could have collapsed is that the interior columns were compromised. It wouldn't be a problem once you gained access to the uh, elevator shafts. Then a team of loading experts would have access to all the core columns and beams. The rest could be accomplished at that point by just the right kind of explosives for the job at hand. NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, acknowledges that the towers came down at essentially free fall acceleration. What are the implications of that admission? The measurements have indicated that Tower 1 collapsed in about 11 seconds and Tower 2 collapsed in about 9 seconds. This is essentially the rate at which free fall would happen. From what I 
what I understand, the buildings actually accelerated as they came down, meaning they were not getting resistance from these massive columns in the center of the core of this building. The core of this building was very heavy. They're huge columns, huge. This block accelerates straight down, uh, or it's picking up speed downward continually. It doesn't slow down, it just continues to gain speed. The Twin Towers could, could not have come straight down through the thousands of tons of structural steel through the greatest resistance. There are columns of steel around the exterior of the building and within the core, all of which are there to prevent uh, the, the thing from falling down. And so if even if something falls on it, it's not going to immediately just go pop, 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 pop like that floor by floor. It's going to, if it's going to collapse, it's going to have to take some time to weaken the structure below it. This structure was capable of holding three to five times the weight. And here it is falling through it with the resistance of only one third of its weight. Roughly 90% of the resistance has been removed. And what's happening is the top section is not crushing down the lower section like a pile driver, which is the picture that NIST basically is painting. It's, it's actually falling into material that's already been pulverized, that's offering very little resistance. It's just coming down through pre-pulverized material. The buildings fall at a speed uh, which can only occur if the structure has been removed, the vertical structure. Structural connections not only had to fail nearly simultaneously, but in sequential order. I was shocked at, the, at how the buildings collapsed, but expected that they would have come down much slower, that they would have tipped over, that, that the, the whole thing did not make sense. And um, ever since then, I had a hard time believing that uh, the fires did drop those buildings. The area below the damage zone where the planes flew in and where the fire was, that area below that, those 80 or 90 stories, 80,000 tons of structural steel was not damaged in any way. Yet you stood there and watched it destroy itself, wiping out floor by floor all 287 structural columns as if they didn't exist underneath the uh, damage zone. Over a hundred first responders reported sounds of explosions and flashes of light at the onset of destruction of both towers. These were not discussed in the NIST report. What did these eyewitnesses actually see and hear? As we were getting our gear on and making our way to the stairway, there was a uh, heavy duty explosion inside the lobby. We stuck on the stairs for a while. We finally got down to the lobby. Then we get to the lobby, there was this big explosion. There were numerous secondary explosions taking place in that building. It was con there were continuous explosions. There was a secondary explosion, probably a device either planted before or on the aircraft that did not explode until an hour later. Then there was those secondary explosions and then the subsequent collapses. It sounded like gunfire, you know, bang, 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 bang. And then, and then all of a sudden, three big explosions. About 50 consecutive bangs and it went, fell down like a waterfall. And we heard the noise uh, associated with an implosion. We heard a very loud blast, an explosion. We heard a loud explosion. At that point, we heard a large boom. Um, you know, I looked up and just saw the building coming at us. Do you know if it was an explosion or if it was a building collapse? To me, it sounded like it. To me, it sounded like an explosion. There was another major explosion. All of a sudden, you hear explosion, and you could see the building starting to collapse. Huge explosion that we all heard and felt. Uh, we could hear a rumble, which was uh, about five seconds long, preceding the actual collapse, and then a boom uh, when each of those towers collapsed. Uh, just seconds ago, there was a huge explosion, and it appears right now the second World Trade Tower has just collapsed. I was about five blocks away when I, I heard uh, explosions. And then you heard from far away, boom, boom. 
and you heard the boom, 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 boom. All by four, it started popping out. It was like, it was if, if they had detonated. Yeah, you know, detonated. They were planned yeah. to take down a building. Boom, 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 boom. And it just started going pop. It just started going boom, 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 boom. And he goes, how fast? They go like firecrackers. They're reporting exactly what I would expect. You're hearing boom, 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 boom. Waves of, 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 of explosions going off. Not one massive big boom. There's so many videos of witnesses from that day that report explosions. There's radio transmissions from the FDNY. We have the transcripts that were recorded, you know, back in 2001 of all these firefighters and first responders reporting explosions. This testimony should have caused the presumption that there was a good chance explosive residue would be found and justified testing for it rather than the opposite. It doesn't look like a collapse. It's like a huge mushrooming, billowing uh, kind of an event. Uh, that whole thing looks nothing like a building falling down. It's a building being blown up. That's what the physics shows. Yet they refuse to consider the possibility that explosives or some other form of demolition device could have been used to cause the collapses of the towers. And the fact that controlled demolition is considered For correction, is this simply saying they're unable to provide a full explanation for the total collapse, even though that was their task given to them by Congress? FEMA documents a 1,200 foot diameter debris field around each tower. Videos show multi-ton steel sections of hundreds of individual steel pieces ejecting out of the towers at 60 miles an hour for a distance of 600 feet. They also show clouds of debris pulverized in mid-air and isolated explosive ejections as many as 60 stories below the so-called crush zone. Videos also show the near total destruction of both towers. What does all this tell us about the forces and energies involved in the destruction? The spread of debris in a large radius around each tower, what we see is an outward explosion of material beyond the perimeters of each footprint. And this is not expected, and it's not congruent with the reports of our government. Debris that was shooting out for hundreds of feet in all directions, 70 miles an hour, leaving the the 80th floor of the North Tower and making a fairly uh, level trajectory, uh, that to me is fairly alarming. Large multi-ton beams were hurled hundreds of yards laterally. Gravity works vertically, not laterally. Something's happening to throw these things horizontally at those kinds of speeds. And here it is trailing white smoke the whole time. It, it really is indicative of um, some kind of explosion. The individual explosions that I noticed 20 and 30 and 40 stories below the collapsing structure. And uh, naysayers tend to say, well, that's just air being blown out the windows. I mean, it doesn't really work to say it's just air pressure. Estimated these are coming out faster than 100 miles an hour. The floors pancaking upon themselves would create gushes of air out the side, but not the kind of explosive force that we saw that would throw I-beams across the street into the windows of other buildings. The uh, ejection of the materials out of the building, the manner in which it fell, the speed at which it fell, exhibited all the signs of demolitions and the completeness of the destruction down to their individual elements. When the South Tower was destroyed, at first it looked like it was going to land in the street or take a building out next to it, and then all of a sudden it disappears in this huge cloud of smoke. 
There were two substations on the 108th floor, uh, the 75th floor, and the 41st floor, and the 7th floor. At those eight locations, there were four transformers in each substation that weighed over 30,000 pounds. The transformers would not explode on their own. They were air-cooled, dry-type transformers. And yet, after the collapse, there was no evidence of them being found at the bottom of the towers. Uh, I wonder why. As an architect, I would expect to see um, larger portions of the building floors, uh, the decking, the steel decking, the concrete topping, much larger remnants of what the structural components of this building was. After all, there was 110 floors in each building, and each floor plate was over an acre in size. We have no explanation of how the concrete was pulverized. It takes an enormous amount of energy. And there's no concrete. There's very little concrete. All you see is aluminum and steel. What happened to the concrete? The concrete was pulverized. And I was down here Tuesday, and it was like you were on a foreign planet. All of lower Manhattan, not just this site, from river to river, there was dust powder, two, three inches thick. The concrete was just uh, pulverized. In its report on World Trade Center 7, which came out in May of 2002, FEMA documents in Appendix C steel that has been melted and even partially evaporated, resembling Swiss cheese. What are we to make of this? This was the size of steel that they used in the construction of Tower 7. They didn't use this particular kind of steel in Towers 1 or Towers 2. So that's why we know its pedigree. It was a surprise uh, to me because it was so eroded and deformed and so um, we took it for analysis in the lab. One section of steel was kept. How it got to be in its present state was described by the New York Times as perhaps the deepest mystery uncovered in the investigation. There's parts where the entire half inch of the beam is, of, is gone, entirely dissolved right through. And so something happened to cause the steel to really thin and in some places to disappear entirely. Well, it was attacked by uh, what we determined was a liquid slag. When we did the analysis, we actually identified it as an, uh, a, a liquid containing iron, sulfur, and oxygen. So Jonathan Barnett's study, uh, which I thought was very well done and, and quite extensive, is all documented by FEMA in Appendix C in their, in their BPAT report that was May of 2002. Unfortunately, it was never used in the NIST report. And I'd like to know why NIST excluded the evidence of melting steel. Well, why is this not included? Why is this forensic evidence not being included in the report? First of all, let's go back to your basic uh, premise that there was uh, a pool of melt molten steel. Um, I know of absolutely nobody, and no eyewitness who said so, nobody who's produced it. You'd get down below and you'd see molten steel. Like a molten lead. steel running down the channel rails. Like you're in a foundry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like lava. Like, like, like lava. From a volcano. Actually melted beams where it was molten steel that was being dug out. Underground, it was still so hot that molten metal dripped down the sides of a wall. It's this fused element of, of steel, mo molten steel and concrete and all of these things all fused by the heat into one single element. And they pulled off a big block of concrete and there was a, like a little river of steel uh, flowing. Many witnesses, firemen and lots of people described the flowing molten metal, iron or steel at extremely hot temperatures and John Gross categorically denied their observations so that because their observations don't fit his preconceived notion he not only ignored evidence, he denied evidence.
there were reports of uh, molten steel having been seen in the, uh, in the rubble pile of all three buildings. And uh, I knew that jet fuel, uh, which is essentially kerosene, uh, is not uh, capable of melting steel nor iron. Um, kerosene or jet fuel uh, w burns uh, at less than 1,600 degrees Fahrenheit. And molten steel needs at least uh, 2,700 degrees Fahrenheit uh, in order to uh, melt. There were sections of them that clearly showed melting. They had uh, sections that were thinned away, and there were actually holes through them. And some of the ends were just melted away or even possibly evaporated away. In an office fire, you cannot generate enough heat to melt steel. And yet we have evidence of molten iron in the microspheres, in the rubble pile, and the metal pouring out of the side of the tower. I worked as a, uh, uh, in the project engineering department of the casting plant uh, of Elcan, the aluminum company of Canada, one of the largest aluminum smelters on the planet at the time. And uh, in that smelter, we turned aluminum oxide into aluminum, molten aluminum. Molten aluminum is silver. It's not yellow, it's silver. It looks like mercury. The yellow molten metal that I saw pouring out of the South Tower is indicative of molten iron. NIST claimed that the molten metal was aluminum. I mean, it doesn't look at all like molten aluminum. It looks like iron. Molten iron. The official explanation of what happened there was that the heat from the fire supposedly softened the steel and melted portions of it, perhaps, and thereby brought the buildings down. Well, second law of thermodynamics says, just like water can only flow downhill when it's poured on the ground, similarly, heat can only move downhill. But with heat, downhill means from a region of higher temperature to a region of lower temperature. And the heat flowing uphill from a 750 degree flame to a 3000 degree puddle of molten steel violated the second law of thermodynamics. You cannot get a flame hot enough to start the metal to molten, make it molten in the first place so that this other process takes off. I don't know of any mechanism for that. The only way that's known that a carbonaceous material can cause steel or iron oxide to, to be, turn into a molten metal is in a blast furnace. Yeah, and that's very different than what we had. Molten metal in the basements of all three buildings, all scientists now reasonably agree that the fires were not sufficiently hot to melt the steel. So what is this molten metal? It's a direct evidence for the use of thermite an incendiary used by the military, thermite is a compound of iron oxide and aluminum, which when ignited sustains an extreme heat reaction, creating molten iron. In just two seconds, thermite can reach temperatures over 4,500 degrees Fahrenheit, quite enough to liquefy steel. We know that open air fires cannot burn hot enough to melt steel but metal had melted at the base of the towers. In one piece, um, I found a pore in the steel that, w that had pure sulfur uh, embedded in the pore, uh, which I thought was very strange. And um, so that's when I, I really started looking for sulfur in, in, and, and finding it in more abundance in some of these, fa in some of these phases. There's a government theory that calcium, calcium sulfate from gypsum boards was the source of sulfur, and that's wrong. Uh, calcium sulfate cannot go undergo any kind of a chemical reaction that produces the element sulfur, and we're not dealing with any kind of uh, compound of sulfur. When we're talking about sulfidation, we're dealt, dealing with uh, the element sulfur. How do you get the sulfur? Um in these uh, pieces of steel or, or in the debris. And, um, and that question is, is unanswered. There's a version of thermite called thermate, 
which has uh, sulfur in the thermate. And what the sulfur does is it, it uh, it's sort of like um, salt on ice. And it just basically makes the uh, steel melt at a lower temperature. And if you do a search on Google for uh, thermite and building demolition, you can find devices that have been fabricated uh, and invented that use thermite for building demolitions. An incendiary is something which can be used to destroy something by the means of heat, while an explosive is something which reacts, acts, with pressure. It knocks things apart. In the case of thermite cutting charges, you would have heard far less noise since they are worked by uh, thermal heating, melting of the steel, rather than an explosive cutting as in RDX charges. Overflights had detected uh, with infrared camera 1400 degree Fahrenheit hotspots on the surface uh, of ground zero. And uh, that being there for a week, um, you know, indicates that there was something very hot going on below the surface. So thermite, if it was uh, present at the World Trade Center and created this molten metal that uh, so many witnesses and uh, photographic evidence shows, would also explain potentially the fact that the fires could not be put out at ground zero. The fires lasted for quite a while, but um, most importantly, they were um, deep within the pile where people would expect that it, the environment was oxygen starved and uh, thermite could explain this because it has its own oxidant within. It's actually the uh, metallic oxide that provides the oxidant to allow the uh, incendiary thermite reaction to occur even underwater. Yeah, for sure. I was going As much as 6% of the World Trade Center dust consisted of tiny, previously molten iron spheres. What does this tell us about the temperatures generated in the tower's destruction? When the USGS collected samples of the World Trade Center dust, uh, they found the iron microspheres Insofar, the USGS does not have a valid explanation for the presence of these iron microspheres. So what do the microspheres contain? Uh, iron is the main element, and then it has smaller portions of aluminum, sulfur, a trace of manganese. Most of them are less than about a tenth in, of an inch in diameter, and they're spherical and they're found in all of the dust blown out of the buildings during collapse, no matter where in Manhattan the, that dust is picked up. You must have had a much hotter heat source for you to get 2,700 degrees Fahrenheit in order to melt the iron to get these molten spheres. Your heat source must be something like a chemical reaction, an exothermic chemical reaction that reacts, in the case of thermite, reacts at 4,500 degrees Fahrenheit. My contention based on finding thermite residue in the dust is that it happened before. It didn't happen after in the, in the fires that ensued in the rubble pile afterwards. It's the, all the characteristics of the microspheres along with what I see in the attack of the, uh, the beams that were actually found tell me that thermite was involved in melting that, uh, those steel beams. Out of the ashes of the World Trade Center devastation rises the Freedom Tower, whose foundation, however, is shrouded in question. For example, in the World Trade Center dust, an international team of scientists find an advanced form of highly energetic nanothermite composites. What is it, and where does it come from? In the dust, we found what we characterize as unreacted thermitic material in the shape of some very tiny red-gray chips, which have different properties. Most importantly is they're still reacting, some of them, and uh, in the reaction they produce molten iron, which is the prime indication of a thermitic reaction. And such a reaction can be used to destroy steel structures.
What we have found is a modern version of thermite, which we call nanothermite, which is produced in a different way. It is not just two powders being mixed. The material is actually built from the atom scale up. We call it the bottom up procedure, which is what you do in nanotechnology. The ingredients are much smaller, which means they are reacting faster and they are more easily ignited. The primary elements in the red material are aluminum, iron oxide, as well as silicon and carbon. The iron oxide appears in fasted grains, approximately 100 nanometers across. The aluminum appears in thin platelets, about 40 nanometers thick. It is the small size of the uh, particles involved in this material that allow us to characterize it as nanothermite. In ordinary thermite, the uh, particle size is much larger, and hence ordinary thermite is an incendiary, whereas as the particle size becomes smaller and smaller, superthermite is sometimes called. This red material contains also a significant amount of carbon, and uh, the formulation of nanothermite as described by National Laboratory Publications also implies the presence of carbon, uh, uh, very typically. The organic is used with nanothermite in order to produce gas, and that is a very high pressure gas. We do have descriptions from the uh, Livermore National Laboratory in particular of how they fabricated this material, but to fabricate it is, is not so easy. This is discussed in our paper in the Open Chemical Physics Journal published in uh, April of 2009. So far, none of these uh, papers have been refuted in the literature, the scientific literature. So that means they are unchallenged in the scientific sense. They stand as a, an indictment, really, of the official story of 9-11. I've independently seen uh, thermitic activity within two separate independent samples of World Trade Center dust. One of the things I'd like to stress about these chips is that they uh, really shouldn't be there. They're not uh, a natural formed um, agglomeration of aluminum from the aircraft or materials that were in the building and iron oxide that got knocked off. It isn't just a haphazard bringing together of iron oxide and aluminum, which is the basic components of thermite. This is a material that um, is made up of nano-sized particles that are all very uniform, very symmetrical. This cannot be paint. Paint does not have these exotic properties. It's impossible. There was actually some significant findings in the residue. After igniting these chips in the DSC, we found uh, microspheres. But the significance of the, of the calorimeter cannot be uh, understated here. Many of these spheres had the exact or identical composition or very similar composition as the spheres that Steve was finding in the dust samples. They were also very similar to spheres found in thermite, in commercial thermite. There were no microspheres found in, in the paint sample that had been ignited in the DSC. Um, we also took paint that came off of the WTC steel and looked at that in the SEM and, and did a compositional analysis of that and found that it was not similar to the red gray chip or the red layer of the red gray chips. So it wasn't, the red gray chips are not the primer paint that was used on the WTC steel. This is material that is, uh, is of military use that really shouldn't be there. You don't need to be an engineer or an architect to see what happened to those buildings. Any honest investigator would be looking at this and looking for explosives and so forth. The NIST investigation didn't go there. They just would, would not look for explosives. This has been uh, the work of independent researchers, not NIST.
So the preconceived notion of NIST is that there's no evidence for explosives, and so there's no point in looking. Uh, that is the most unscientific thing that you can possibly think of, not to look because the, the, you don't expect to find evidence, and in fact the evidence is overwhelming that these red-gray crystals are very high temperature incendiaries. They state these conclusions for which there's virtually no evidence, and then they ignore conclusions that can be drawn from the evidence. The physical chemistry of everything that I wrote about is consistent with no other hypothesis. And all of the testimony of eyewitnesses, all of the video evidence supports only controlled de uh, demolition as the cause of all three World Trade Center buildings uh, destruction. You don't have to be a chemical engineer to question that official story. It's very, very obvious that both Building 7 and the towers were brought down by demolition. It couldn't have been any other possible way. That conclusion I, I come to based upon, first of all, my training, uh, and my education, uh, particularly uh, my experience in blowing up major structures that had been designed to withstand blasts. The experience that I had gained uh, in the military and as an engineer uh, was irrefutable. I couldn't. I, I couldn't come to any other conclusion except for the fact that those buildings were brought down by explosives. They fit the profile. The only way that a building can accelerate as it collapses is by having pre-engineered, precisely timed and precisely placed explosives. In other words, controlled demolition. It is my opinion as a former 12 Bravo combat engineer, well trained in the use of explosives, that this building, all three buildings were brought down as a, control, as a result of controlled demolitions. We know we've been lied to about 9-11. Uh, we don't know for sure who did it. We don't know exactly how they did everything. And that's why we need a new investigation to find out. We do know that there was a massive cover-up, that there was evidence hidden and destroyed. The American people absolutely need the truth of 9-11. Yeah. Oh, no, not yet. Well, we're back again. And uh, be sure to watch the rest of this. Uh, we're going to show the rest of uh, the, let's see, it's the part about the, the psychologist discussing why it's so hard to understand 9-11. Anyway, we'll, we'll show the rest of that clip on October 6th, the first Saturday in October, when we'll be back and we'll take calls on that too at that time. In the meantime, we've been joined by David Fura, also from the Portland Action, the, arm of, the action arm of the Portland group of AE 9-11 Truth. Did I get that anywhere near right? Sorry, okay, yeah, the Portland Action group of AE 9-11 Truth. Okay. Correct. And... Uh, you have a few things to tell them about scheduling and, and also might want to make a comment about this. So take it away. Okay, thanks, Bill. Yes, that's right. So um, uh, we're actually recording this in advance. So by the time this is going to be broadcast, we're going to have one more library event um, still to come, and that's going to be in Portland uh, on, the, uh, on the 18th, uh, Tuesday at 6 o'clock at the Portland Central Library. So that's a week from 9-11 at the Portland Central Library at 6 p.m. Uh, in addition to that, um, there will be two more showings of the complete version of this show uh, on this station, or, or actually, uh, you know, different stations that, re that rebroadcast uh, this show. Uh, on Monday, the 17th of September at 10 p.m., Channel 23 will be showing this uh, show in, in, in its entirety, uh, as well as on um, Thursday the 20th at 5 p.m. on Channel 22. I told them earlier that they showed it twice on 9-11, so that was great. You know, normally you don't get that type of service, but I asked them nicely. That's great. <laughs> Fantastic. Actually, they surprised me with that, but the fact that it was on 9-11 right when we wanted it. Very cool. It was, Really nice of PCM. Thank you, Portland Community Media, for making this show possible. So uh, we have a few more minutes left. I thought we would take a quick look at some of the points of evidence that really uh, 
relating to the, uh, the, the, the two towers that came down. I, I actually find that Building 7 offers the easiest entry point in 9-11 Truth, but the towers themselves are uh, also very interesting. Um, one of the key points is that um, many people look at the fireballs and think that, wow, that's very hot fire, and that's what caused the buildings to come down. It was just that much heat. Uh, but even the NIST reports say that those fireballs, in fact, all the jet fuel had burned off in about 15 minutes. And so uh, after that, you had just normal office fires. And the NIST reports say that those office fires would typically burn off uh, at about 30 minutes in a, in a little area, you know, burning the, 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 the trash cans and whatever, whatever else was burned. Before it moves on. Yeah, so and after that... It, you know, they would just migrate around like a normal office fire would. They also say that the, the towers had plenty of reserve, that the, they, they withstood the aircraft uh, impacts very well, and they had lots of built-in reserve. Um, and so we have a situation where we have normal office fires that were not even that hot. They did mention that the fires were, had, were giving off black smoke, which is indicative of an oxygen star fire. You had reporters who were saying that these fires are almost out, uh, especially on the South Tower. And you had the firemen, two marathon runners, actually had, re or the first one anyway, had reached the first impact floor where the airplane hit. And he was reporting back that he just sees a few scattered, off, scattered fires. Give me two hoses and I can knock them down. And that's when the South Tower came down. That's when they dropped it, yeah. As he was radioing back the report, in the impact zone. That's exactly yeah, the time that the tower came It's to hear out. it. You, know, you have a recording of that, and you can listen to it. That's right. And they did show real briefly the, the south tower, the first one to come down. The top portion of it tilted about 24 degrees before it came down. Yeah, so it should have been toppling all the way into the street. Instead, it disintegrated before it got halfway down. Exactly. Unfortunately, that was the first one to come down, so you couldn't. There was not as much camera work on that. Right. So you could see it coming down, and it go, before it hits the bottom of the of the of the visible area, you just see the explosions coming up, but right. you don't see the whole thing coming down. Um, yet, even though you had this asymmetric loading, you had a symmetrical collapse. It's, it's explosions remarkable. coming out all sides symmetrically, even though the top part fell over the edge. Well, the thing that, you know, I, I typically got into blog type arguments with people, and you point out that, yeah, that could have happened, this could have happened, but the math proves that the official story isn't what happened. And you look at, like, what David Chandler was saying, you measure the, the rate of fall, and it turns out to be about two thirds the rate of gravity two-thirds the speed of, of a gravitational fall, the acceleration of gravity. And, it, and what that means is that all of the resistance of the building underneath was only one-third G. Okay, now if it's only resisting one-third G, now because of Newton's laws equal and opposite forces, the maximum that the top can be exerting on the bottom is also one-third G. Right which means that the bottom is being destroyed with one-third of the force that it withheld before the collapse began. That doesn't compute. People think that they I mean, and they're right. It would take a tremendous amount of force to do the damage seen. But to have it happen with one-third of the static weight of the top of the building? Nonsense, folks. Nonsense. Yeah, that's kind of a, a little bit unintuitive how that works, but... Typically, you know, you, you would expect that the, uh, the top is pushing down harder. Uh, that happens when it's slowing down. When it's slowing down, you're actually getting tremendous pushing on both ends, top and bottom. But when it's accelerating down, getting faster, is actually putting less force on the lower part than uh, it was when it was standing still. Yeah, if you were standing on a scale and it's still, your weight is being registered. But if you and the scale are falling, now the scale shows zero. Right. Until you hit something. Then it's, and That's it's the, the same way. As long as the smooth acceleration that was observed, and we're not talking about conjecture now, it was smooth. When you do the measuring and look at the graph, there are no sudden changes in acceleration that, as would happen when it, there were impacts. Oops, sorry about that microphone. <laughs> but at each impact would be observed on the graph 
So it's not a question of I think that it happened this way. The graph says it did not happen that way. Right. Period. That's un, that's the end of the discussion. It's not possible to suggest it happened that way. Now that we have that graph, right? And that's a good point. And it's also another physical uh, law. There, conservation of momentum. Uh, mass times velocity has to be maintained. And so as the as you get a crunching where a, a next floor is hit by the top, the mass of that whole glob now has increased mm -hmm. to be higher than it was when it, right before the impact. So at that point in time, you should have got a, a deceleration, right. and which makes intuitive sense anyway. When it hits, you should expect to see down, the collisions. Right. You hit the wall with your hand, and your hand stops. That's a dramatic slowing down. And we never saw any slowing down. There's no evidence of any impacts whatsoever. And beyond that, you never see actually any pile driver effect anyway. The top part is being blown outside the right, perimeter. Right, that so-called pile driver effect, as you see on the David Chandler videos, the part that's being destroyed, there's nothing above it anymore, but it's still being destroyed. There's, there's, there's no evidence of anything pushing the top right. at all. You can't see anything pushing. It all you starts see is with something out. at the top, okay, but it's destroyed first, and then the rest of the building gets destroyed by what? Nothing. Right. We've got about two minutes left. Okay, I want to just say, um, anything more to say about those towers coming down? Um, not exactly. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what people have to say, you know, when we start watching the entire video. And we'll open it up to phone calls on the 6th, and we'll probably get some pretty good comments. All right. I, I do want to mention uh, a couple of things about our group. And in particular, we have a website. And it's uh, it's this pretty similar to the the main AE911truth.org site. You just stick Portland in front of AE. So we are Portland AE911truth.org. And if you go there, you'll uh, you'll get a, a, all of our scheduled events uh, coming up uh, all the time. And after 9-11, we're going to go back to our normal schedule where we show two or three um, library events. Uh, we'll be showing this video uh, at local libraries, and those are free showings. And we hand out free copies of the DVD there as well, yeah. handmade copies. Come to the library and get one. Yeah, so the next, as we mentioned earlier, the next showing will be on the, uh, the 18th, which is uh, Tuesday, at the Central Library. You'll get a free DVD there as well. Um, and again, this um, the video will be showing again on Portland Community Media on Monday the 17th at 10 p.m. Channel 23, uh, and Thursday the 20th at 5 p.m. on Channel 22. And uh, thank you very much for watching. And then be sure to watch our show again October 6th, live at 5. And uh, thank you for watching. <laughs>